and welcome. Welcome everyone to Home Nursing Foundation's continuous medical education series. And today's series is on common wounds in the community. As you know, Home Nursing Foundation has been serving frail and vulnerable homebound patients for 47 years now by providing home health care services such as home therapy, home medical, and home nursing. We also operate two senior care centers and day rehab, wellness at Haogang and Wangkok, and also an active aging center to serve the needs of both dependent and well seniors in the community with the aim to improve their function, health, and well-being. And under the prolific clinical leadership of Dr. Ng Wai Chong, we have the privilege of organizing this series of continuing professional education so that we can bring home and long-term care sector and raise our capabilities to care for our patients holistically and empower them to live joyfully in the community. We have completed a series of end-of-life care for frail elders, functional rehab, dementia, falls and osteoporosis, mental health, and Parkinson's. And this current series on the wound management in the community are all available on YouTube videos on the QR code link. We also warmly welcome you to attend our caregiver conference on the 6th of October this year at Sunset Convention Center, or you can also attend virtually. Please look out for the QR code link and sign up um, as soon as possible. As we launch our care path and caregiver support in the community, we will be inviting experts, practitioners, and caregivers to share their perspectives and experiences. We hope to see you at the conference in October. This afternoon, we are very excited and looking forward to this interdisciplinary panel discussion on three complex wound management cases in the community. I will now pass the time to our advanced practice nurse, Priscilla, to introduce the team and dive into the cases. Please enjoy. Thank you, Dr. Christina, for the introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Priscilla. I'm an I am the Advanced Practice Nurse here in Home Nursing Foundation. Uh, I will be your facilitator for the discussion for today, and we are very, very happy to have a multidisciplinary panel. Um, so we have Dr. Wilson Chong, who is one of our locum doctors, and he is very, very experienced. Um, he has got background in emergency department specialist training. He has got a grad dip in uh, family dermatology, as well as some um, specialized um, compression air works uh, background and training. We also have assistant nurse clinician uh, Joan, as well as uh, nurse clinician uh, Corinne. And we have our head of social work, uh, Brandon. And Dr. Ng will be also curating the Q&A section. So if you have any questions um, in the midst of all the presentation, please feel free to put it in the, uh, the Q&A, and then we will get to them as we go along. Okay, so without further ado, let us um, hand this time over to nurse clinician uh, Joan to go through with us some of the cases that we will be discussing today. Okay, hi everyone. I am uh, ANC Joan here, and today I'll be discussing. Uh, I'll be sharing with you all three cases on the common wounds in the community that. Home Nursing Foundation uh, sees almost on a daily basis. So the three wounds that we will be... So the three case discussion that we'll be talking about will be the incontinence associated dermatitis, fungating wound and pressure injury. So we'll start off with the case discussion on incontinence associated dermatitis. As you can see from this wound, this is one of our patients. So a little bit background of the patient. Uh, Mr. A is a 43-year-old gentleman who is a public assistance card holder, was referred to home nursing for nursing review and home medical for chronic illness management. So Mr. A has a past medical history of Down syndrome, obesity, spinal stenosis, diabetes with HbA1c of 9.5% and seboic dermatitis. So background information, uh, his ADL, Mr. A is dependent on showering, dressing, feeding, continence, and transferring. Mobility status, he is bed bound. Nutritional status, orally, uh, Mr. A takes two meals per day, and most of the time his meals consist of porridge with side dishes. And his main caregiver is actually his elderly uh, uncle. 
So uh, upon our first assessment when we went in to see patient, okay, so the first time that the nurse went in, we noted that the diapers was heavily soaked with um, feces and urine. And uh, Mr. A is actually very obese, so he was always lying down most of the time. So the uncle actually uh, used Keltostat to, to apply on the wound. Uh, that was what he had at that point of time. And, and, and then we also consulted our home medical uh, to get some permission to catheterize patient because the IAD was very bad. And then we did some CGT for the uncle. We taught him how to do um, the wound dressing. And then eventually, because Catoset was a, a, of a high cost product, we switched down to Poridon iodine. And then uh, Poridon iodine, that inodine, and Mepilex foam. And then uh, eventually, when uncle was competent, competent in the wound care, we switched down the visits to weekly. We started off with three times a week. Okay, so what happened was uh, uncle had to go for a surgery. His, uh, his mom could not manage him because mom was on the petite side. So eventually, uh, we referred him to our social worker side and then patient went to nursing home. Okay, so I would like to discuss about the uh, issues identified for the medical part. Most of the time when we went there, patient was always in pain. So every time when we turned him, he would be groaning. Uh, most of the time also patient refused to turn due to the pain. So he was very comfortable lying down and uh, that was his most comfort position. So we, 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 we had to get medical on board to manage his pain control. And also, we also looked into his diabetes control as he was only eating two meals per day with HbA1c of 9.5%. So for the nursing part wise, we did caregiver training for the uncle. We taught him how to ensure to get, to get them to do a diaper change every three hourly, ensure that patient was frequently turned. And then also, uh, as they were using wet wipes to clean the wound, we taught him how to use a no ring cleansing solution, which was, which was the aloe vesta foam to clean the sacral area instead. Okay. So, yeah, apart from that also, patient did not have an air mattress, a hospital bed. So we got our social worker site on board to assist with the application of the air mattress and hospital bed. All right, thank you very much, Joan, um, for the presentation, as well as highlighting to us some of the problems that you, the team has identified during the visit. I will now open up this uh, discussion to the panel to get a multidisciplinary uh, view on how we should approach such a patient. Uh, Joan, do you mind uh, we go back to the, back, to, the, to the background of the patient? And I will now get um, Dr. Wilson. Uh, would you like to share with us, you know, when you are... Um, looking after such a patient, what are some of the concerns that you will have back, um, when, you are, when, you, when you review this patient? Dr. Wilson, you're muted. Um, we, first of all, we need to get our concept uh, correct. That means uh, what we want to do. So first, uh, we need to find out why there is such a a wound happening in the first place. Now, of course, in this case, it's incontinence and uh, chronically lying down supine. Uh, number two is that then we have to decide that how are we going to stop the source or the cause and then manage the complication, which is the wound itself. Now, uh, fundamentally, I think everybody here has some idea on uh, what to do for the wound. Uh, maybe you all can post some of the uh, idea on the on the in the Q&A session so we can discuss and we learn from each other. And lastly, sustainability, whether we can sustain using such method of a wound management. All right. So, um, okay, for, for this one, the, for this patient, uh, of course, the cause is because of incontinence. So, of course, uh, catheterization is a, is a necessity. But in this case, there should be a finite uh, finite uh, uh, time frame for the catheterization because we can't put in a catheter, catheter just because of that. And then after that, we have a catheter uh, induced issue. Then there will be the next CME or CPE. Okay. Then, uh, okay, for, for the wound itself, uh, what do you all think? Do you all think that uh, what should we use? I mean, fundamentally, there will be alginate. We, um, we, uh, we, look, we have alginate, we use uh, foam dressing. We can use uh, hydrofiber. Uh, these are some of the basic, uh, rather basic uh, uh, dressing. Okay, so in this case, we like to absorb the moisture. But don't forget that because of urinary incontinence, 
uh, whatever you put in will absorb urine as well and even liquefied feces. So now we are actually holding all this unwanted excrement onto the wound, thinking that it's moisture. Of course, all the vendor will tell you that, oh, I, I, want, I, want, uh, I want moisture, moisture, but it needs to be the right type of moisture. All right, so we don't want all these things to get into the foam and then hold it there. Then, uh, this, this, therefore, the characterization will come in place. Also, uh, frequent cleaning and uh, dressing. Then, after that, if it's infected, okay, then uh, we may need to add in an AG. Then, the next thing, next question is sustainability. Uh, if all these dressings are not cheap, so big pieces, then we have to spend a lot of money. Okay, so maybe you can think along this line and give us some suggestion or your opinion. Yeah. Um, John, I, re I recall you gave us some um, interventions that the nursing team did as well. So while the rest of the participants are thinking about what questions Dr. Chong has uh, posted, uh, maybe you can share with us a little bit about you know, how the wound has progressed and what kind of dressing materials um, your, um, the nurses have used in this case. Okay, so initially, uh, we started off with Keltostat. Uh, Keltostat can also assist to stop the bleeding. And it also happened to be the, uh, the patient's uncle had a lot of supplies. So we didn't want to go, we didn't want to go and waste um, getting them to order more uh, other type of wound products. So we, we, we started with the Keltostat. Along the way, when the wound improved a little bit, and because uncle is able to uh, sponge patient like almost every day. So we decided that we should just stick to a powder iodine that with inner DIN instead. In the course of the care, um, what were some of the other concerns you had? I, I recall that you did yeah. mention iodine that. Is that quite painful for the patient? Are there uh, other alternatives? And maybe I can post this to Dr. Wilson as well. Yes. Uh, Keltostat uh, per se itself, all this doesn't cause. Uh, pain. Um, Keltostat has a unique uh, property that you can, you can uh, help in hemostasis. If you look at a wound, uh, initially when it becomes dirty and all that, there's a lot of micro bleeding. So Keltostat helps uh, a lot in this case. Um, but in the early phase where, where, where infection is feared, so maybe an AG, Keltostat with AG, it, it comes in different names. Keltostat is actually a brand name. It basically, it's alginate with AG, silver, ion, then that can help in the prevention or help in any infection. But that's quite expensive, I must say. Okay. And um, let's hand this time over to uh, Brandon as well. Brandon, when you're approaching such a case with elderly caregiver and a patient who is very obese and probably requires quite a bit of care, heavy caregiving duties, um, what is your approach to such a patient? Yeah, so when this case surfaced to us, actually, we see it as essentially really a case of a vulnerable taking care of another patient. So the, the question is, the paramount question that comes to our mind is um, the sustainability of care. So there are a few um, variables here. So one is patient is obese. Then there are the, there's the mother, uh, uh, elderly mother and the other elderly uncle who have increasing difficulty turning patients and rendering hygiene uh, care needs, hence also contributing to the incontinence uh, dermatitis. So uh, for these, there are also other uh, red flags. The uncle, out of eagerness to help, the uncle actually claimed that he could perform his caregiving duties, but we noticed occasional lapses in turning patients uh, and also having these soap diapers. So when we see soap diapers, there are two main contributing factors. One is money issues. The other one is ability issues. So whether they are competent enough to turn patients. So after some investigation, these two variables are present. So one is financial problems and the other one is the inability to turn patients because they are two elderly. <clears throat> so what we do with this case is really... Uh, linking them up to financial support to get them the materials that they require for better wound care. The other part is really to look into uh, right sighting of care. So right sighting in this case will really mean ensuring that patient is put into a place where appropriate care can be given. So uh, quite obviously these two uh, members in the family, the mother and the uncle is not so capable of rendering that. 
care. So this is how we uh, have approached the case. Okay, thank you, Brandon, for your input. Actually, I have a question to pose to Dr. Wilson. Uh, medically speaking, this patient being obese and the diabetes, uh, having HbA1c of 9.5 is quite suboptimally managed. How would you approach this case in terms of nutrition? Okay. Um, firstly, I mean, some of the product like zinc, uh, all these, they said that it will help in uh, wound improvement, uh, vitamin B, vitamin C. Um, but it really depends on the uh, patient because they are caused, they are they need to go and collect the medicine and then they need to feed. So this is one of the options, some of the consideration. But of course, controlling diabetes is essential here. Uh, once we control diabetes, then a lot of things are much easier. Uh, however, uh, in this situation also, there's a, there's a concern because the caregiver is actually uh, elderly, right? We, we can't go in, uh, we don't have a nurse to stay with them 24 hours. So this is a difficult issue. Um, so we have to assess the caregiver itself. And then of course the, uh, the, the diabetes is essential. Um, then after that, we will follow up slightly more frequently and see how they are coping with that. Mm. Then of course, the last option is that you, if you really cannot then have admission, which is, this is uh, like a forward locally because uh, admission is a difficult. We have a lot of bed restriction here. Uh, so we try to avoid that. Yeah. Thank you everyone for your inputs. And if you have further questions, you can put into the Q&A. In the meantime, uh, we, we do need to move on to the next case as well so that we can have a bit more discussion, equal discussion also. So I hand this back over to Joan, who will present us with case number two, which is a fungating wound. Hey everyone. Okay, so the, now I'll present on a fungating wound. Uh, as per the picture, you can see over here. So this is Madam B, a 83-year-old lady. She's a single elderly uh, living alone. She, uh, she was referred to home nursing for wound dressing with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, breast cancer, and iron deficiency anemia. So a little bit background again. She's actually independent in the activities of daily living. Uh, mobility status wise, she ambulates around using a walking stick. Nutritional status, uh, her nephew actually assists to order thin cut meals for her for her lunch and dinner. She skips breakfast. Uh, no main caregiver because she lives alone. There is a CCTV in her house where her nephew actually monitors her uh, on and off. And when we first visited her, we actually asked her like, uh, why did she? Why does she skip breakfast? Uh, one of her reasons is that there is no one to go down to buy food for her. So uh, how I got back some history from her is that her wound started off with a small pimple-like sore and then worsened overnight with nail pain. So when she was discharged from the hospital, uh, the product, the, the wound product that they ordered for her was a gatol. So during our first visit, uh, as per the picture over here, hold on, I'll just go back here a bit. Okay, so when we removed the gatol dressing, uh, there was a bit of uh, bleeding seam. So we did, actually what we did was we cleansed her wound and then we applied a gatot and a non-adherent silver cell dressing and we are going in to see her twice a week visit. Okay, so for the issues identified for her because she has a history of anemia, uh, bleeding was a concern. Also her nutritional status wise, uh, we were thinking on the line whether we should start her on milk supplement with protein powder and also uh, having breast cancer, her prognosis uh, was something that we had to look into. Also, since she being an elderly, there was a high fall risk. And then the medication that she was on, she was actually on tramadol and panadol. And uh, we were afraid of her uh, having some uh, falls. Okay. So yeah, then uh, because also she was, uh, she was saying that she, uh, her desire was to actually go out, go down and buy food. We also referred her for our home personal cleaning so that uh, we could get someone to come in to help her to clean her home one, uh, once a week and also assist her with some grocery shopping uh, and if possible to just bring her down to buy food. So uh, we also refer her to our social worker to apply the senior mobility fund that she could purchase the wound products from. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joan, for the second case presentation. Shall we go back to to the background and then we can open this case up to the panel again. 
Okay, for multidisciplinary approach, how would we look at um, caring for Madam B? Maybe Dr. Wilson, I hand this over to you to start off. Right. Um, once again, we approach every case with the aim in mind. So we ask ourselves, what is the end point for this? Uh, meaning that uh, what we hope to achieve. Okay, let, let's pause for a few seconds to think about what do we hope to achieve at the end of the day? Is it completely heal, complete healing? Or it is, is it uh, palliative? Or, or, or we don't want the foul smelling, easy to look after, or hopefully the wound is a bit smaller. Okay, so um, once we go through that, then our path will be clearer. In this case, I don't think we'll be hoping for a complete cure. Uh, the reason is because it's a, it's a cancer and it is uh, fungating. Now, so we hope to achieve uh, two or three things here. Number one, uh, no bleeding. Number two is that no, not foul smelling and uh, therefore uh, less pain or infection. Okay, so three aim. So ideally is that um, first the expectation, so we have to set up the stage for this. That means we have to discuss with family, we discuss with patient, understand the palliative. Uh, concept and uh, even get a palliative team in if your institution have it then uh, then we will approach the wound ideally uh, now what do we have to achieve okay this wound bleeds so we need to stop bleeding like i've explained just now the kelto stack or what we call the alginate dressing is ideal in this situation uh, when it is number two is that when we remove any dressing we try not to yank on it it's not little one large piece of you know, you, you create a bigger wound. So one large piece of the uh, tumor may come off. Okay, so don't hang. So soften it first, then uh, gently peel open. Next is that we would like to uh, maybe uh, decrease uh, the foul smelling. Some people, if we used to use hydrogen peroxide, uh, you know, if, uh, somehow this hydrogen peroxide is, I feel that it's, uh, a lot of people like to use it because they like to see the bubbling and all that, you know, they get excited which is a good alternative, then iodine itself. But iodine has a disadvantage that it stains clothing uh, brown. And sometimes when we met fiber thing, they turn it dark blue. So that's an option. Uh, of course, a lot of chlorhexidine. Okay, painting a layer of iodine may not, uh, may not fulfill our 100% aim. Sometimes we need to put iodine or whatever anti uh, anti uh, antiseptic then we seal it off for five minutes, then we take it out and clean it off. I think that uh, helps a little bit more than just painting it over. And uh, last but not least, then now we we'll come to dressing. So what it is, what is the type of dressing you want to consider? I've mentioned the alginate, uh, sometimes foam dressing with AG. Uh, so again, these are a little bit more expensive than uh, uh, this uh, TG, that means uh, TG dressing. Or nowadays we have some with iodine impregnated, you can put it on. Yeah. And and then if you put a gauze, that means the TG or the impregnated uh, gauze type of thing, then you it's good to put a layer of gauze behind just to absorb any uh, exudates. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Then, yeah, use of antibi oral antibiotic you need to be careful because if it's a chronic wound, sometimes we create resistance. So that's a plus minus. Okay. Okay. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. And maybe we can tap on uh, Sister Corinne. Um, in your experience in caring for such patients with fungating wound, and actually this is relatively small, we have come across really huge ones with a lot of heavy exudates. What would be your approach to caring for this patient, not only just the wound, but you know, looking at a wound on your body like this is not going to be easy. What what do you see your role as a nurse when you do the home visits? Okay, so uh, just now I think uh, uh, ANC Joan and Dr. Wilson have touched various uh, points how to approach to this kind of fungating wound and also the, the previous wound. So I think all in all, we can hear that it is really the holistic approach. So when we approach a wound, we don't only look at the wound, we look at all aspects, right? So when it is uh, a wound that is highly, highly exudated, and moreover, this uh, uh, elderly, right, she is uh, still able, you know, to, to go out and things like that. 
And even though it is a palliative wound, we would still want to encourage you know, uh, patients to be able to be uh, as mobile as possible, to socialize, and then uh, also to, to you know, be able to go around their neighborhood and meet friends and things like that. So it is really the image that is affecting uh, a lot of patients with uh, fungating wound, and then they don't know how to manage the smell, the, exu the exudates, and also the choice of the, the, the wound products is very important, like how uh, Dr. Wilson pointed out just now. And of course, traditionally, um, as, as nurses, sometimes we will give uh, some home remedies advice, right? Like sometimes we'll say, maybe you can try tea bags, you can wrap uh, the tea bags around together, I mean, as a secondary uh, dressing. Uh, and then uh, it can hide the smell. Some even use some charcoal dressing as well to actually uh, uh, try to uh, filter away the, the smell. And of course, if you know that your fungating wound is very highly exudative, then uh, you really need to think of the secondary dressing, how to absorb all those exudates. Whether is it Gamgee or is it a foam that can really uh, uh, kind of like lock in the, the exudates uh, will do any better. But of course, we all know that sometimes the cost of the, the products is, 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 is always a very practical and big issues for uh, patients with wound. So if you use foam dressing, and we all know, lah, right, foam dressings are very, very expensive versus uh, things like gauze and gamgee. Yeah, so usually fungating wound in the community care, it is um, every other change, every other day change, sorry. Yeah, so... Whether using a foam dressing, is it appropriate uh, in terms of cost or maybe just a gamgee will do? So all these factors will actually affect uh, how uh, as a nurse when we approach the wound, right, uh, the decision that we want to make. So like their financial uh, and then their, their uh, psychological, are they uh, good enough, uh, well enough? And also the, the pain management. And I think the most importantly that we kind of overlook is the, the caregiver as well. So if let's say in the picture, there is a caregiver and a caregiver is the one that is of course helping to change uh, the wound dressing, we really need, need to look into the caregiver competency and also whether the caregiver can cope uh, with the wound changing as well as the smell and, and do they know how to you know, uh, manage the, the wound. So all these things will come in place uh, when we do our home visits and then we assess not only the wound, but we also assess the caregiver competency. And then from there, we can pick up uh, whether we need to reinforce certain management, we need to teach uh, the caregiver uh, a new uh, uh, nursing management, uh, bedside care for the for the wound and things like that. Yeah. Maybe I'll also open it up to the floor um, through my little bit of learning from say some of the wound causes. Um, witnesses have actually um, advised on maybe can you if the dressing materials are really very expensive, can use things like sanitary pads, uh, tube top dressing. I mean, do you have any experience in that? And is it helpful to make application and securing of dressing much easier for them? Definitely. I even heard of diapers. Maybe diapers. Yes. So there are people that with highly exudative wounds, they actually use the diapers uh, aside to, to the sanitary pads. And uh, I think there are also... Uh, patients that actually uh, use the tube fast instead of those uh, uh, tube top line. Because tube fast is, is light and very uh, uh, airy. So it doesn't, you don't feel uh, very like uh, hot and humid in, when you're wearing it. Yeah. And I do come across, I mean, we do come across um, patients with very innovative ideas. They will cut into different shapes for their tube fast and then they wear it like, you know, really like a very fashionable kind of top. And then they can actually, uh, and they're very over their t-shirt and, and it, it doesn't look very uh, unpleasing when they go out. That's great. Great ideas for all of us. And yeah. also, um, I remember uh, Joan presented that this wound bleeds easily. Maybe I can ask Dr. Wilson, um, what would be your advice for such patients besides the dressing? Is there anything that can be prescribed for the bleeding wound to be applied topically? Yeah. So um, for we. I mean, if a doctor or nurse, we can inject them with adrenaline, with lignocaine, yeah. Um, but of course, the caregiver itself is difficult. So if it's spurting, we can either ligate it. Uh, in ligating such a wound uh, using a suture, we have to go deeper, don't go too superficial because they are all uh, easily crushed and you know, they, are not, they are not normal tissue. Then if not, you can put topical adrenaline. Uh, is to one is to 100,000 or one is to 200,000, meaning that one valve of adrenaline, you dilute in 100 mils of normal saline, 
that will give you, I'm talking about a neat adrenaline for resuscitation. Huh? So one valve into 100 mils, that's one is to 100,000. Or if you want about half a meal in 100 mils of the normal saline, is uh, one is to 200,000. But dental preparation, they have lignocaine 2% mixed with one is to 80,000, a slightly higher proportion. Uh, that has lignocaine effect as well. So you can use that as well to put on the wound. Um, but uh, this type of wound, when you put on lignocaine, adrenaline, you need to compress it. It doesn't mean that you put that and you walk off and it's going to be all right. So be careful. Of course, uh, it can also increase the uh, fungating or the uh, uh, gangrenous effect of the dying tissue. Okay, this needs to be understood. And in some people, injecting can cause palpitation. You need to know sub or increase in blood pressure. Okay. Uh, then next is the dressing. Dressing itself, actually in the market, the uh, like said, algini is uh, is common, but there are some with, uh, for example, they have a crustacean. That means the prawn shell, uh, 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 what do you call it, impregnated gauze. They also can stop bleeding. Uh, some product called quirlin. You know, quirlin we used to take uh, for children who have diarrhea. Uh, those products impregnated with uh, quirlin can also help in hemostasis. Yeah, but these are found in some special dressing, which is not so common. Yeah, these are, can be used. Then, uh, then, then I must stress again a lot of time, compression is just enough. Mm -hmm. We've I, seen also transaminic acid and flagellum yes. powder. Is yes, that I, something? Yes, hmm. yes. All, all this actually by sure, sure. Uh, as long as patient don't have coagulopathy, uh, any powder, anything you can put on, then you press on it, you will stop bleeding as well. Yeah, even potassium permanganate crystal, you put on it, you can stop bleeding. But that that's not what we use. I mean, commonly used. Although it's used in uh, vet, quite common. Yeah. Now, um, actually, I want to pose this question to Corinne is that uh, in what product, for example, like they have said like activated charcoal uh, and all this reduces smell. So in your experience, does it really work well or it just uh, 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 um, induce yeah. belief? Like, like a lot we, of we do, get, mm -hmm. we do get positive feedback from the patients themselves as well as the caregivers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but of course there are common questions, right? Then they will ask how many tea bags I need to use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are how many uh, activated uh, charcoal dressing I, I need to put on so that the, the smell can be, you know, uh, uh, managed. But I think all in all, uh, uh, what's more importantly is uh, how you manage the exodate. Because you know, if your exodate is really very high and, and it's a, really a lot, and then if you don't change the dressing, and then the moisture is there, the, the humidity is there, then bacteria will easily actually go on, onto the wound as well. And then that causes the, the, the odor, right? Yeah, so then I think uh, the most importantly is are they changing the, the dressing uh, regularly and also has and when, when it's needed. Lah. I mean, not really required to change the primary dressing, but the secondary dressing that is soaked with the azotics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's more important mm -hmm. uh, to manage, to control the, the odor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some of the, one of the uh, participants says that does uh, really tea bag helps. Does it help? And what kind it of... Does, it does. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how like how many percentage it, it does help, but we do uh like I mean if if um you think about let's say your shoes, there are some households that actually put uh tea bags into their shoes, right? To actually mask the, the odor coming out from the from the used shoes. So I think it, it kind of helps and and I I I mean we don't hear the, the patient or the family members come and tell us say that it, it doesn't. Yeah, and, and some tea leaves they give us give off a very nice uh pleasant smell yeah so yeah. it's on top of the primary dressing and mm -hmm. the secondary dressing then you put on the, the tea bag and then you wrap you wrap around it so yeah. there is some then next question people ask maybe is chinese tea better or english tea you know is the food or is it better than earl grey or just yeah, yeah it doesn't make a difference i, I, I think i think no i think it's your it's your preference if you like the poor smell go ahead and use it <laughs> Right? If you like Lipton, then you go ahead and, and use Lipton as well and, and agree. Yeah, so I think because sometimes the tea smell can give off a very um, very therapeutic uh, kind of uh, healing method as well. Like, so, you know, the moment you smell, you, you, you actually smell it and then you feel like relaxed and things like that. So if, if it does help you like 
like even mint leaf, then yeah, I think can just go ahead and use it. So um, basically, is that you're saying that the primary dressing like a gauze or, or, or two TG, and then you put the tea bag after the after the tea after bag. the secondary. Okay. Yes, correct. The, like uh, let's say if you let's say we are using alginate, so mm -hmm. your primary dressing is the alginate, right? Then after mm -hmm. that, you will put on Gamgee or you put on your sanitary pad or diaper for the secondary mm -hmm. absorption. Then on top of that, you can put on the tea leaves. Mm -hmm. I mean the tea bags. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, and for those who do not know, Dr. Wilson loves to joke. <laughs> okay, so we'll bring in uh, Brandon, who is also very important in the care of this patient because firstly, the patient has quite a devastating diagnosis of C8 cancer, and this patient is um, single and still able to go about in the community. So, in terms of psychosocial care, let, um, let us hear from Brandon. Ah, uh, yes. Thanks, Priscilla. So I just want to link back to the point that Joan made just now about Senior Mobility Fund or SMF in short. So SMF in a local context here in Singapore is a fund for subsidized devices and for wound dressing products. So for this lady, 83 years old, single, unemployed, without significant uh, income. So this scheme has helped her a lot in procuring uh, the device and the uh, consumable products that are much needed for her um, recovery. But there are other psychosocial issues that can hinder recovery, if not creates more problems for the wound recovery. So his, her mood is one factor that we want to look closely into. Uh, for people who have visited her, who knows her, she shows a cheerful personality. But uh, we wanted to, social workers, we wanted to be more cautious behind that smile. Uh, if you know her history, there's actually little things in her life that, that alleviates her mood. So you can see she has lost a lot. She has lost a steady gait. Her wound is pretty bad. It alters her concept of her own physical identity. And that can have a very big impact on people who cannot come to terms with it, who may even have some adjustment disorder. Uh, her life is also very unstimulated. So she spends a day mostly alone at home, uh, watching television programs. But we all know that uh, television programs is a very passive activity, so it's, it's, it's no good for uh, cognitive stimulation over time. And uh, one other main point is also about uh, prognosis. So her prognosis is not very optimistic. So we wanted to work with her on uh, more advanced care planning matters such as LPA, lasting power of attorney, uh, letting her have that platform to share her wishes, preference, and arrangement should she become uh, in a state unable to do so in decision making. So all in all, this case, I, she will benefit from uh, social stimulation from, for example, day hospices, uh, referring home therapy services for environmental assessment for fall risk prevention. I think one thing that, uh, uh, that, was the, that I didn't mention just now was the multiple fall risks that she, that she experienced at home. <clears throat> the other part, a big part is on counseling and support groups for her, uh, for her condition plus her prognosis. <clears throat> and where indicated, if her mood does indicate contrary to what she presents to us, then a uh, suicide risk assessment will be much needed to make sure that uh, we have attended to, we have looked into all these risk factors and put in place uh, protective factors. So uh, this is how we would come in to approach this case, uh, looking at the wound, but also beyond it, because there are factors beyond wound that can affect directly or indirectly on wound, wound recovery as well. Uh, back to you, Priscilla. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brandon, yeah. for insight to this. Uh... Can I can I raise a question to everybody? Uh, one or two questions. Number one is that does all the supplement help in this case? Um, I, I, maybe we can think about it. Number two is that um, bring this is a cancer patient. Of course, uh, we, we we are more familiar and rather. So in recent years, we also talk about palliative in the elderly. Now, if this is a patient. 
uh, we think that this elderly is not going to make it in the next six months to a year, but has a big wound, maybe not a cancer wound. Would you treat the same? And is there any difference in the two? So maybe these two things that we, we can ponder upon and uh, your answer will be, uh, or your suggestion is most welcome and let us know in, in the thing. That means number one, does all the supplement helps. Number two is that uh, if the patient is an elderly palliative patient with a similar wound, maybe not a fungating cancerous wound, just a, a wound, yeah? for example, very bad, very deep bed sore, uh, uh, and, but it's palliative, then would the approach be different or the same? So maybe, maybe uh, this uh, Priscilla or Corinne or, or can, uh, and uh, Joan, Joan can give us uh, some of your, your thoughts. Okay, maybe Do you want to take this? If, yeah, anybody. Yeah. yeah. So personally, um, for myself, I think we go back to what you, you mentioned in the very first time we opened this we open up this case for discussion is actually what is the aim ultimately we're trying to achieve in a in an elderly patient with maybe a very bad bed sore maybe stage four unstageable um, you know with the comorbidities and the chances of having maybe deep-seated infection even osteomyelitis or even a maybe a cancer wound like this that is uncurable Perhaps the aim for full recovery of the wound might have shifted to being more um, symptom management, which is pain, odor, exudate, to give them some dignity even in a, in a wound that may not be able to recover. Of course, we hope for, for better. We hope for the best in our good care management, in optimizing nutrition, optimizing caregiving so, and social circumstances. But there are, there are times where we may not be able to fully optimize everything and nature might take its course. So how to prepare the patient and, and even support the decline, I think to me is important. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there will be no difference. You're saying that there, there are probably no difference with palliative, okay. yeah. But the, the mentality be... and, the, hmm. and the hope and of how we approach this may not be too different. It's still the best care possible, but we, we accept that the end point might be different, I think. Yeah. So yeah. There's, a, there's a question coming, is the elder pa pa patient with palliative will not equal to dying in short months. So suggest curative is possible given time and nutritional support, pressure relief measures. Yeah, that, that, that's a good thought. If you think that uh, the wound will probably heal faster than the patient passing away, then maybe you can try. But uh, I, I just have to uh, bring this out that is that you don't raise the expectation of caregiver because at the end, you'll be in a big problem later on because uh, it's, it's not so easy. You know what I mean? Yeah, actually to the participant's point, elderly with palliative wound does not equal to, to dying, but it's also to manage the expectation, like what Dr. Wilson said, and our approach and our mentality is still the best care, but mm -hmm. it might not be full recovery. Yes, that's right. Unfortunately. Yeah. Then, uh, then okay, next is that, like I said, I asked uh, Corinne or John that I, I heard vitamin C is good. I heard um, vitamin is good. I heard zinc is uh, fantastic. Can I have all these things for my, for my, uh, my, my mother, you know? So what, what would you... What, what is your thought on this? All the supplement and, uh, you know, and uh, some say collagen. <laughs> okay, I, I, I don't take the question. I think, okay, firstly, I'm not a dietitian, not a nutritionist. So I'm not very well versed in terms of like, you know, uh, how, what's the dosage and then uh, what's the amount that I really need to intake to, you know, to, to reach the optimal with nutrition. But I think before we think about, uh, uh, of course, when we assess a wound uh, and we assess our nutritional status, uh, we also look, need to look at um, whether the, the patient can actually consume them as okay. well. So if, let's say, uh, this case is an elderly and she is on, let's say, uh, a nasogastric uh, tube feeding, we uh, can give the supplements and the absorption will be uh, to the optimal. I think, I think it's very questionable really. Right, uh, mm -hmm. compared to uh, someone who is able to you know consume and swallow with no uh, issues, 
then I think, uh, and their absorption rate, their GI absorption has no issues. I think that that, that will speak otherwise as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, I mean, normal healthy people like us, if we take all these supplements, I guess it, it does help. But if let's say you are you, you are a patient and then you are having NG2 or even PEG and things like that, uh, mm -hmm. I think the, the moment you pound it, uh, it, it, may, it may kind of affect the, the absorption rate and it affect uh, uh, how much of the the, the dosage actually can get uh, to, to the patient's uh, body. Yeah, I think nutrition is still important, but it's really whether the patient can actually intake all of them. Yeah, yeah. and I think by overdosing all these supplements, it, it doesn't really help as well. Yeah, so it, I think it's a balancing of everything. Yes. I mean, the family is really keen, heard so much about something. Well, if there's no harm, you know, I have come across people who believe in cactus. Yes. Juice cactus juice to, to help, you know, and they wanted to ask to give it through IV. You know, okay, you can believe that. There, there are things like that. Of course, within boundary, we can. So it's a totality of, uh, I mean, some of them, uh, they want to do their best and all that. I guess, I guess there's no harm. But some people, they, they if they are taking tablets, let's say uh, 20 tablets each time, three times a day, I, that, I personally, I think there's a little bit over the, over the age. Well, I leave it to everybody to their comfort though. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so thank you everyone for the very lively discussion. We have one more interesting case to cover, which is a pressure injury. Mm -hmm. So let's move and uh, we'll have Joan to present the last case to us. Okay, so now I'll be presenting uh, on pressure injury. Uh, so as you can see from the picture here, uh -huh. Okay. So actually the, the pressure stop saw started like this and then it slowly moved on and finally eventually it was like almost healed. Okay. So a uh, quick background is Madam C. She's an 85-year-old lady referred to home nursing for wound management for her pressure saw. Past medical history of hypertension, diabetes, or HbA1c 7.2%, perforated gallbladder, stroke, and anemia. So background information, she is dependent on dressing, showering, transferring, feeding, and continence. She is chair-bound. Uh, nutrition status, she's on DM diet, high-protein diet, and main caregiver. The very nice thing about this um, patient is she has two dedicated main caregivers, which is the helper and the daughter-in-law. So for her wound, uh, the initial picture, we started off with dodum gel with foam dressing to debride the SCAR. Uh, eventually, when the SCAR was loosened up, we, start, we changed the wound product to Aquasa AG with foam. And when the wound started to get a bit more better, we switched in to Poridone Iodine that daily. So both caregivers are competent. So they had no issues in managing this wound. So for the nursing part where we identified was we actually had to educate uh, the caregivers on the wound progression, like what to expect when the SCAR is being debrided. You know, that like it could be a little bit messy, it could be sloughy, uh, and then to look out for any signs and symptoms of infection, and also, we also have to educate them on the pressure points, not just manage the pressure injury, the other pressure points of her body. And we really did some intense caregiver training for the helper and the daughter-in-law. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joan. So now, same thing, we'll open it up to the floor and maybe we'll start with Dr. Wilson again. Right. So again, um, we looking at this patient. The patient has a, a florid uh, medical uh, history. And we want to find out that how this uh, secret saw uh, developed in the first place. Uh, then after that, of course, uh, then we strategy, uh, we uh, certify our approach and our aim. So I think this is possible to be healed uh, in the sense that wound can be healed. So again, uh, choice of dressing. Now, when we come to choice of dressing, everybody has some idea on what it is. Uh, so actually my suggestion is that you try a few on different types, especially when you yourself have wound, then you will know how does it work, uh, what is the downside. Um, we talked about the Dudum uh, gel, actually there's a autolytic uh, gel, basically it is just moistened, the thing it comes in different brands, Coloplast has it, and it's different types. Uh. So uh, you can try on it so that uh, we do not need to do a surgical debridement. Um, but remember that once you debride the wound, the family baby got a shock, you know, because they can see what's below. Uh, not every family can handle that. Uh, that one you need to prepare, maybe show them some picture. 
you know, like uh, maybe show them my picture first, then they will be less shocked. So, uh, so what you do is that you really need to prepare for them because uh, they are occasions that family totally freak out and thought that you have done something bad to the wound. This is my what my experience. Then after that, of course, is the stage by stage. Again, at this point is that a lot of us, um, we tend to think that one dressing for all. That means one dressing can throw out everything. Yeah. I mean, yes and no, depend on your culture, depend on your place and what you have access to. But I have explained this before that wound comes, healing comes in different stages. So this one, we have to switch our mindset and depend on what it is also. So don't get fixed. So uh, the other thing is that don't get the family to buy one whole big packet of the same uh, uh, dressing or uh, wound, wound dressing. So that will be a problem if you need to switch, you know. Huh? Okay, so this uh, this is a quite classic of a certain uh, sacred saw in bedridden, and of course turning and all that is the main main uh, thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I bring it to Corinne. Um, for this patients, I think John mentioned a lot of caregiver training, um, a lot of. Uh, warning the family about autolytic department like what Dr. Wilson said oh my goodness from one black piece which is dry becomes this whole big red colored wound that looks very raw and scary so besides all this um, you know what is your approach to to caregiving for this patient or, or nursing care for this patient so um, I mean pressure injury are very uh, common actually uh, in, uh, not only in developed countries like us. So, um, firstly, I think when we look at this kind of unstageable wound and, and like what you say is like one dry piece, um, usually when uh, we approach, uh, when we assess, uh, a lot of time, uh, I'm not sure whether you all agree with me, but a lot of time when it come out, when it discharge from hospital with this black piece, their only uh, wound product is always iodine soap, soap go gauze or inodine, and then they will just patch it, patch on it. But I think um, I, it's, not, it's not wrong, but uh, as a nurse, I would like to find out what is the treatment goal in the first place. Yeah, so I probably will uh, approach in a way that I will discuss with the caregiver, uh, especially the family members, or if the patient is uh, communicative, what is the treatment goal? Do you want an active treatment? Or uh, is it uh, just leave it black and dry, like the, leave the SK there. So, uh, and of course, we don't blindly ask as well, and we don't blindly take heat from uh, and instructions from, from uh, the caregivers or the, the family as well. Uh, at that end, we really need to look through the medical history, the pre-morbidities. Also, we also need to know whether by giving an active treatment to this wound, does it help them? Right, and if it is for active, then yes, uh, it will be an autolytic uh, kind of uh, dressing for for the debridement to take place, and then uh, um, caregiver training like what Dr. Wilson had shared just now, the, the preparedness for the caregiver and the family members is very very important. Uh, a lot of time, I mean, I do receive feedbacks and complaints before calling in and telling me that. Uh, the primary nurse came in and then uh, did something to the wound and now the wound actually wasn't. But when we come, come to trace back uh, to what the nurse had kind of recommended and done to the wound, then we realize that it's not that it wasn't. It's just that the ESCA have, have kind of been uh, uh, dissolved by the autolytic dressing. And then what appears is the wound bed. And the wound bed can be very scary, very raw, all the way until you might be able to see a very deep cavity and also a bone exposure in the event if it's at the sacral. Yeah, so a lot of time, I think communication is very important in our nursing care. I think in all lines of uh, procedure that we, that we do, communication is the first thing that you really need to know how to communicate to the caregivers, even the, the patients themselves, of what you are going to do, what to expect, and then how are we going to come together and help you with your, with your progression of the wound. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, not only uh, to prepare their, their mindset about uh, what comes next, um, we also need to explain to them uh, that at every stages of the wound, we will use different uh, wound dressing to actually aid in the healing. So after the ESCA actually kind of uh, being divided off, 
we cannot expect the nurse to actually continue with the, the, the duodenum gel or the, or the comfield plus, the hydrochloride uh, dressing, right? So we would expect there will be changes to the, the, the products because a lot of time, um, cost is an issue as well. And with the cost issue, right, they will be co complaining, right? Say, why you keep asking me to buy this? And then now you ask me to change to the, the other dressing, which is so much more expensive. And then not only this, I need to buy the dressing set, I need to buy the solution, I need to buy uh, the secondary dressings. So uh, these are real problems uh, in, in the world out there. So I think uh, as a nurse, uh, we also need to kind of communicate to them that do expect uh, that there's variation of the selection of the products due to what? Due to the, the appearance of the wound. And if the wound look very sluffy and very infected, we probably still need a doctor's review. Probably will need a course of antibiotics. Uh, and then uh, maybe you need to change the product to some silver products as well. So uh, if you're asking me about the nursing approach, is one thing is uh, the communication. And of course, caregiver training on caregivers' uh, competency, we really need to assess, uh, do they know how to turn appropriately? And is it a, a bite by two hourly turning, two to three hourly turning, and then the diaper change as well? I think a lot of time people overlook the diaper change. They feel that as long as the diaper is not wet, I do not need to change. But in Singapore, I mean, for in Singapore weather, the weather in Singapore is so humid, right? And even with even people like us, when we are wearing thin clothing, we even have like a uh, humidity in us. I mean, we perspire and then there's moisture. So what about patients with diaper? Definitely there will be moisture, uh, moisture trap in the diaper as well. So I think this is very important because if you don't change your diaper, uh, recommended la, is every uh, four hourly. Uh, it kind of also uh, will, will actually not help with the, with, the, with the wound dressing and wound healing as well. Yeah, so uh, the two hourly turning, uh, the, the diaper changing, as well as uh, the, plan, the, the caregiver competency in cleaning the wound uh, and whether they are cleaning it correctly. I think uh, the nurses in, the, in, in this session, y'all will know a uh, different kind of wound appearance will require different kind of ways of, of uh, cleaning the wound, right? Whether is it a, a linear, uh, linear uh, cleaning or whether is it a circular motion? Or whether with a cavity, do we need to flush uh, with, with a syringe and things like that. So all these are to be taught to the caregiver who is actually uh, changing the, the wound dressing very regularly for the, for the patient. So I think that that, that is uh, what, what will be the nursing approach. I just want to add on to what yeah. Corinne said. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have caregivers who, uh, I would say they are very dedicated in the wound care. They actually do their, their, the whatever we taught them properly. But sometimes, like for example, if you have patients who have ESCA and we apply dodum gel, we have to constantly remind them not to over apply the dodum gel. We do not want the surrounding area, the peri wound, to be macerated. Yeah. yeah maybe, maybe. Yeah, then maybe you can uh, go through every dressing that you use and the rationale behind it for this patient. Okay, so for the... uh, they, they, we, we like to invite people to uh, to have different suggestions or even to dispute with us. Uh, we, I, I would like to see that so that mm. we can uh, invite more opinion. Okay, so the dodum gel is actually to loosen up the escar. Uh, and then when, once we switch on to the aquasa AG is when there is a cavity, it's also like antimicrobial. And uh, eventually, it does not need to be changed every day if it's not very highly exudative. Every other day will be, will be fine. And last of all, we switch to povidone iodine is because it's already almost healing. So that can be done daily. So John, besides dodum gel for the uh, what other products can... Can, you can, can also use those uh, like comfield hydrochloride dressing. So the wafer type. Yes, the wafer kind. Okay. And any any other suggestions from Dr. Wilson or Corinne? Um, or the chat? Yeah, you want to go first, Dr. Wilson? No, no, you, you'll go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think for Duden Jiao, uh, there are a few variations uh, out there in the market in Singapore. I'm not sure about other countries, but uh, like things like Intracite, it's also one. I think some hospitals are still using uh, in intracyte gel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, other than that, dodum is quite common next to intracyte. Mm -hmm. Between the gel form and the wafer, what are your considerations and why would you choose one over the other? Um, I guess 
it is also whether uh, the caregiver can manage manage it well. Uh, like because like uh, the wafer right is like a foam like dressing. It can just and it has this non uh it, it is adherent but it's very gentle to the surrounding skin so you can they can just patch it on and it's very convenient right? and you leave it there for I think uh three to uh, three to five days and let it like kind of like uh be bright and auto 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 uh the autolytic to work lah. yeah but for gel it is quite it can be it can be quite messy mm -hmm. yeah but that's um, why we choose it oh sorry. Is, does it work faster? That's why it, you choose it the as gel, well? Uh, definitely, because the contact point is, is, uh, is there. Like, there's a big, bigger contact point with the gel than the, the wafer. It, because our sacral and our gluteal, there's uh, uh, some, cur I mean, like, uh, can be curvy, right? And there is some uh, areas whereby the, the wafer, the, the patch doesn't, not, not able to reach completely. So I think gel, whereby you apply it to the to, to the wound and to the size of the wound, I think I think it helps also. And I think another reason is it depends on where is the eska and where is the slough that we want to remove. So we don't only use student gel for uh, this kind of uh, black eska dry patch. We can also use it on wounds uh, that have portion of uh, portion of the wound there is uh, some slough area. And with that, right, it's very impossible to use the wafer to actually kind of like apply onto the sluffy uh, area and then we put other wound products to the other portion of the wound. So I think gel is still the best way to actually be able to reach uh, these areas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I also want to remind some of the, we put the gel, so I've seen before people put gel and put gauze over it. So actually the, the gauze get the hypotolytic uh, department, not, not the wound. Yeah, so to be mindful of that, they, we need to seal off. Lah. Hence, some actually some vendor, I don't know whether any vendor locks in, but uh, they like to advise us to use two types of their product. For example, they put hydrolytic gel, and then they put the duodenum extra thin on top. But to me, I think it's, uh, it's a little bit wastage. Uh, just be mindful of that. Maybe a, a, a decadent film is good enough to prevent it from uh, absorbed by the skin, uh, absorbed by the gauze or the, or the clothing. Yeah. Uh, can I add on to this? <laughs> I, I, I know the time is running out, but due to the gauze, right, that Dr. Wilson pointed out, uh, there, there are two kinds of gauze. Mm -hmm. So one is uh, the, if it is quite rough, and mm -hmm. then there's another kind of gauze, I think, whereby uh, it is quite uh, smooth. I think it's more close, the, the fiber is uh, closer. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if really you need to use the duodenum gel, and then you need to use the gauze as a cheaper option, right, then uh, use the one that is like, uh, have smaller pores. Uh, yeah. Woven and unwoven gauze, is it? Yeah, yes, correct, correct. Yeah, the woven and unwoven one, the non-woven one. So can use the, the non-woven one. Yep. Tagadum is very cheap also because one, one piece is the thin film. Yeah, but sometimes you need to buy the big ones for safer. All right. Okay. And then for what about the cavity wound besides Echocell Silver? Is there any other dressings that we can think of to, to put in the cavity? I think iodine, iodine soap is also one way to actually be able to uh, kind of trap the, the soap, the, the soap goes into the, the cavity. Uh, a lot of time, I think uh, that, that works uh, and, and it's the cheapest option as well out there. Uh, it doesn't need to be changed. Uh, daily. For iodine, right, recommended will be daily. Because if you are read, um, I mean the research papers, evidence based practice, right? It can I I only solution kind of like uh last up to eight hours for the antimicrobial to be active. Yeah, so daily is actually recommended. Uh, obviously, we don't expect you to change three times a day, like, I think that's uh we will take a a a hard toll onto the the caregivers. One last question for myself, huh? So for um, pressure injuries like this one is a chronic one. Is it necessary for family members and patients to buy sterile dressing sets? Or, I mean, we've read evidence that actually uh, cool boiled water is also good enough for wound cleansing. Uh, definitely, cool boiled water is enough. Uh, of course, we know solutions like normal saline, uh, even water for irrigation, the, the sterile water, it, it can be quite costly for long term. If for a chronic wound, 
uh, even let's say the funky thing wound just now that we presented, like Dr. Wilson shared that it's good that you soak and then you remove the primary dressing not to actually peel off the, mm. the, the wound bit, right? So if you are if you use the normal saline solution, right, it's kind of it's, it's, it's quite wasted actually because the cost is there. So actually cool white water is, is good enough. So cool white water meaning we boil the water and then we let it let it cool. So by boiling the water to the boiling point 100 degrees Celsius, it kind of kills off the bacteria. That's why it's safe for us to, to actually drink it. Yeah, so it, I think the, the, the same kind of a concept can actually apply to uh, when you want to clean, uh, clean the wound. So with the cool white water, I think it, it is uh, fair enough. Yeah, for on this, uh, I'd like to end on the point that, that you can must remind the caregiver to can change the container uh, when the you just cool boiled water, you know what I mean? But don't change it after the water is cooled down. Yeah, you know what I mean? That means you, you boil, then you pour in the container. After you cannot change container, unless you want to change it, can, but it must be hot when you're changing it. One of our participants uh, actually says that uh, mm. they will use thermocene or grand granular scene. So mm -hmm. I believe we, there are many other wound irrigation mm -hmm. solutions out there like Organicept, Organilin mm -hmm. as well. So I think these are also for consideration and mm -hmm. if, if there are resources like that the family can tap into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are actually many, many types. In fact, there are some who they I have seen them using honey to, to coat the gauze uh, and then impregnated with honey, for example, also there, there are people who does that. Uh, it's, it's a packet, it's not a traditional care, it's, it's a marketed uh, wound dressing as well. So there are many and there will be more coming out, hopefully. So they will, actually we do have more, more choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, we go now to Brandon to walk us through this case and how he will approach it if he is the social worker that is taking care of the family. Yeah, thanks Priscilla. For this case, actually, uh, the, the, the good thing about this caregiving system is that at the point of psychosocial assessment, there were no apparent signs of distress. So they were coping well and good. <clears throat> but there was one potential issue. The, the new helper is not familiar with the local health care and caregiving context. So in time to come, this may give rise to many different issues. So hence this calls for uh, a preventive psychosocial care to upstream the caregiver preparedness including educating them how to properly work with this new helper who may hold a very different worldview from them. So where, that, where there are differences, social workers want to facilitate both the employer, in this case, the family caregiver, both the employer and the helper to understand and align the cultural differences of illness and caregiving. For example, we have got cases where the helper may not necessarily follow recommended wound change frequency, not because of blatant poor care, more, but more of cultural irrelevance. So this, that, that helper that I recall followed her habits back at her rural hometown. Mm -hmm. That obviously the care standards is different from, from, from countries to countries, right? So hence, <clears throat> For such cases, we, may, we, we, we have even seen extended relatives then starting to accuse the helper of abuse. And the things just uh, follows a very vicious cycle. The whole tension may just cloud what really matters for patient wound care recovery. So, so really in, 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 in working with a new helper, we also need to help both the uh, employer and the helper diet to understand uh, these cultural differences and what makes a good care here in the local context, wherever the caregiving may take place. Yeah, so relevance is very important. Otherwise, misunderstanding may just arise and hinders a lot of good work <clears throat> that the healthcare professions wants to do. Another part is on managing the employer's expectations. Now, in our line of work, we see a continuum of uh, employers' inclination. They may come from the very demanding one to the very permissive one. And these two extremes gives own sets of problems. For the very demanding one, it gives rise to um, burnout helper. So you may have heard of news or even in your own practice that helper just run away. And then the poor soul family caregiver may just 
have to bear the whole, whole, whole load of care. And that is not sustainable. Now, the very permissive caregiver then gives rise to, to, to a situation when it may be unmanageable in terms of uh, managing the standards of care. Because in those situations, the helpers call the shot. And we do have uh, some cases in following that kind of profile. So to, to, to work with these, uh, these situations, the helper, the caregivers will need to be uh, much in a much upstream and preventive uh, stage to already educate them to support the helper as much as the helper is supporting the patient. Only then this caregiving system becomes more sustainable in the long journey of caregiving, especially for wound care, chronic wound care patients that may take a long time to heal. So these are some of the works, psychosocial work that will benefit um, this profile of uh, cases where it involves different cultural landscapes, different worldviews coming together to care for the same single patient. Brandon, maybe I have a question for you. Yes. Uh. So mm -hmm. in, your, in your experience, how would you, uh, what would you say or what would you, how would you approach an employer who is very, very demanding of the helper and maybe there's a lot of caregiver stress on the helper's part? Mm. I think the, the first approach uh, social workers like to take when we approach a very stressful caregiver, we want to acknowledge that they are a victim of their own circumstances also. So all those demands, all those high tension is actually to us a distress call. They are equally a victim of their own circumstances. So we normalize and support their stress. Then that builds the rapport and trust for us to work on more difficult issues. Yeah. So all those um, demands and, and hard push to a helper to do a to Z list of tasks could be a desperate cause actually. So after the trust is gained, the next step is to really to divide and conquer together with the caregiver and the helper to work out a more uh, sustainable approaches. Yeah. So really, how do we go about doing it is really a very case by case uh, approach because it also depends on the uh, readiness of the employer. Sometimes family influence their ideas as well. So it may not be just employer and helper, but it may well go beyond the diet into family, other family members who may influence their thinking and decisions. So it's no surprise sometimes we work with a much bigger group than the two diet, uh, managing the same wound. Yeah. And, and what about the other extreme then? The very, very per permissive employer who leaves everything you tell my mate, <laughs> you tell my helper. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So actually, I got this one case that still leaves a very deep impression in me. This case, they were permissive because they have got no other way in their, in, in, in their, in their perspective. They have got no other way because if the mate leaves, they spend a long time getting the mate trained, getting the mate, knowing the ins and outs of patients, uh, idiosyncrasies, patient preferences. So the mate is the pillar. So they don't want the mate to go. So in the, of course, the mate can sense that, you know, they are the, she's the pillar. So she can have a high bargaining chip in the family. And it ends up to a, to a point where the mate starts to have harsh treatment to the patient. Mm, harsh treatment to the patient, you hear it right. And the family just say in a in a in it's at their mercy and just pleaded with the helper, please don't do that. You can do some other things, maybe. But it doesn't work. And our our role there is to advise the family members of this vicious cycle, this um this abuse, abuse vicious cycle, that it, may, it can only get worse because they will only get more daring. They will only be more daring and more uh, harsh treatment may just follow. So we got to really educate the employer. This is a, a no-go. It will only get worse from the many cases that we have seen. And to empower 
and journey with the employer to find a good replacement and assuring them that training can come. So really, it's more of an empowerment stance to the employer and assuring them that there are systems in place that can handle this kind of situation because this is not the first situation. So they need a lot of support to journey with them. Sometimes they are just so helpless. So joining with them, assuring them that things have been done successfully before are, are, are some of the ways to go in working with some of these very permissive, helpless employers. Yeah. So I'm aware of time. I'm going to end this point here if uh, anyone has any other further questions. We actually have a lot of interesting questions, but unfortunately, our time is up and we really overran. And we want to thank everybody who is uh, contributing to this discussion. And, you know, if there's any questions, you can email us again um, um, through our email, uh, email address, and then we'll try to get to them. Um, so I'll hand this time back over to Dr. Christina and Dr. Ng as well. Okay, um, thank you everyone. Thank you, Wilson, Corinne, uh, Priscilla, Brandon, and Joan. Lots of pearls of wisdom. So as everybody would tell that this is a slightly different format from um, the previous method where we actually have a lecture. Like the previous one was by Wilson, giving a systematic approach to, to wound. But this one, we've got three cases and with lots of discussions. And uh, I hope, you know, like me, you uh, really come to appreciate the, you know, the, the, the wisdom, you know, from practice. Uh, things like, oh, you need, you need to, uh, not changing diapers just because it's not wet, it's not correct, you know, and uh, tea bag, you know, you can actually use it for absorbing the, and there's so many others. I, I looked at our Q&A, we have answered 47 questions and there's still eight to be answered. So there's a difference between coming here live versus listening to YouTube later. If you're on YouTube, you won't have the advantage of reading the answered questions. Um, but then again, uh, um, uh, it's wonderful that uh, it's, only, it's going to be on YouTube. So initially, my plan was um, really to summarize what I've learned, but I don't think it's necessary. You've learned so much. I would like to invite all the audience, the 284 of you, if you could participate like by typing onto the Q&A, one take home, one learning point that you learn from this. We won't be reading it out because we just don't have the time. But by typing it, it helps the organizer to see what actually worked, what actually was impactful. And also to the student, you know, as a, uh, as a person you know, teaching uh, geragogy, pedagogy, Actually, participation by the audience is very critical for your own learning. So if you could just type one thing that you learn, it helps you, it helps us. So please, I invite you to do that. So before I end, could, uh, could we invite Christina to, to share uh, some closing notes? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I wanted to say thank you very much to the panelists, Dr. Wilson Chong, Corinne, Joan, and Brandon for sharing these gems where we are trying to create a holistic system of support for, wow, <laughs> for all our patients and as well as their caregivers who are often neglected. And uh, for that matter, I will also strongly encourage all of you who are online now to sign up again for the caregivers conference on the 6th of October. Uh, please scan this QR code. There's free lunch provided if you are able to attend on site at uh, Suntech City. If you are not, please join us virtually to listen to the various panel discussions as well as the sharing from the speakers, which I'm sure will also provide a level of um, understanding as we might not have been aware of the different perspectives that our patients and their caregivers face. So um, with that, I would want to round up today's uh, conference. And for those who have questions that are still being in the process of being answered, we will leave this uh, conference on for a while. But those who are already um, done, you, you can log off. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Take care, everyone, and have a very good weekend and afternoon.